competitive economic system in which people, corporations, and governments have to compete over various resources and opportunities, and in every exchange become consumers or producers of commodities, and oftentimes the very commodities themselves, is going to undermine any attempt at a democratic society. Democracy coupled with any economic system based on the management of scarce resources. This includes hybrids such as social democracies and the like. It's not going to work. It's delusional to raise a person who is in one form or another subservient to someone else in a so social hierarchy, be it a parent or a job or a corporation or a government or another cultural group or another social group. 99% of the time, and then tell them that once every one or two or four years they have the power, they can vote. That's not going to work. Democracy must be built into the system, not something that's added on after the fact. The power of the market supersedes the power to vote. Everything in this market system is up for sale. Politics is no different. Our government is subject to the same rules of scarcity driven by the market as corporations, so it should come as no surprise when they behave like corporations or become part of the whim of corporations. Lastly, democracy within any context is going to be confined. Whether it's confined to two predetermined political parties or a handful of predetermined political parties with their predetermined ideologies or platforms, or whether it's confined to natural law, you can't have fully free. It's always going to be within the context of that environment. Beyond capitalism. The competitive exchange of scarce goods has been a major, if not the only, economic process since the Neolithic Revolution bred specialization. However, we can trace its former theorized roots as capitalism somewhere around the 17th century, where the owners of the means of production transition from powerful nation states battling in trade wars uh, to private entrepreneurs or merchants. Now this is a useful economic system when one, you can justify competition based on the fact that there isn't enough going around, and two, you can have infinite growth. We can't have either one of those anymore, so it's time to move forward. Didn't want to spend too much time beyond capitalism, because we're at the left form, so I figured we'd get that. Beyond scarcity. Material scarcity, and thus the economic system that derived from its existence, has been transcended. Not in a market sense, not in a social sense, but in an empirical sense. Thomas Malthus was the first to try and understand this relationship between the human economic process and the environment from which we extract resources. He concluded that the rate of population growth was exponential, and that the rate of our subsistence, or our ability to extract from the earth things that we need, our basic needs, was only linear. And it's from this idea that we've been operating ever since. But there's another trend that's affected humanity since the Neolithic Revolution. That's ephemeralization. That's the ability to do an increasing more amount for an increasing number of people with decreasing energy. So, whether something is scarce or not is less a matter of how much of it there is, and it is a matter of how we can cultivate it, how we can get it and extract it and manage it. So how have we exactly transcended scarcity? Well, I'll start with food production. Despite the fact that almost a billion people suffer from undernourishment, we have enough food to feed everybody on this planet. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the food that's wasted is enough to feed the hungry of this world four times over. Now, despite this fact, we're actually not even uh, producing food as efficiently as we could. There are vertical farm systems that require little to no soil or water, virtually no pesticides, and a whole lot less labor and land that could pro provide the same amount, if not more food, that's more nutritious for everyone on this planet. 
This would leave the arable land, the farming systems, and the cultivating of animals, meats. It would have more room for that as well. Clean water. Given that the 65% 60, of the human body is water, we can't live more than four days without it, it's quite crucial. Let's skip the part where I talk about how so many people suffer without it, how the future major conflicts are going to be determined by water scarcity, and get to the part where I, I explain that it's accessible for everyone. 97% um, of, the, of the world's water is salt water. We can use desalinization to make this clean, fresh drinking water. The entire continent of Africa today could be provided with enough fresh, clean water, and the desalinization plants would take up only 2% of its coastline. Energy. There's a broad spectrum of clean, renewable energy, wind, solar, geothermal, tidal. I'm going to go with my example, uh, geothermal. That's my favorite. I like the way it sounds. Uh, there, there was a plant recently built in Ethiopia last year that can harness, harness almost 9 billion megawatt hours a year of energy. Despite increasing levels of unemployment since the recovery, even though since the recovery, we've been, we've been experiencing higher levels of efficiency. And this is due to technological unemployment. Technology has been displacing human labor for a while now, but the labor for income paradigm was able to maintain relevance due to the technology creating a new industry. Right now, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple collectively are worth about a trillion dollars. And they only employ 150,000 people. These are the new faces of the newest industries. And there is not a massive job market here. With increasing accessibility of 3D printers, nanotechnology coming on the horizon, which would actually democratize the process of production, and you don't need corporations anymore. It's getting hard to justify the labor theory of value. But instead of fighting for this, we could embrace it. We could free humanity from doing the jobs that they don't want to do, and put us on the, the pursuits of higher things. So we represent an organization called the ZCAS Movement. We are a sustainability advocacy organization. We acknowledge that the problems of this world, such as relative and absolute poverty, uh, energy scarcity, war, hunger, these are not the causes of some corrupt government or political party or some innate form of human nature, but it's the socioeconomic system itself. We are loyal to a train of thought, not an ideology or an institution. We advocate the technical approach to social management, as opposed to monetary or political one. We find that there is no static end process for humanity. It's going to constantly be evolving and growing. And as, we, as our environment evolves, and as we observe our environment, the way that we manage our resources, the way we operate and run society, should reflect that evolution. And we should not remain stagnant. It's just the cycle of observing our changing surroundings, uh, using the newest, most efficient methods of sustainably cultivating and allocating resources, and three, updating our society accordingly that we advocate. This process, again, is constantly evolving. There is no end yet. When we do this to meet the needs of the human population as efficiently as possible, while remaining sustainably as sustainable as possible, we've entered what we call a natural law resource-based economy. Now, why should you adopt these thoughts or even be interested in them? What can the Zeitgeist Movement offer the left? Harry Kaysen will speak more about that, why it's fundamental for the left, not only, but for all of humanity, to realize this train of thought and pass it off. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, it is a pleasure um, to see uh, so many people here today. And yes, uh, uh, I'm going to. I really am just going to uh, reiterate a lot of, of what has just been said. 
Uh, Johnny has given us a good uh, introduction to the issues. So um, the question that I wanted to address today, what does Zeitgeist have to offer the left? And so um, I would begin by saying uh, that the Zeitgeist offers the left an exciting, systematic program. Systematic, this is key. Systematic program that the left could embrace and make viable if we were brave enough, forward thinking enough, and able to learn how to cooperate and, co and compromise with our fellow leftists and, um, and recognize that there aren't the, you know, differences between us that really should keep us apart. Uh, the Zeitgeist program offers a comprehensive, dialectically opposed program. And what I mean by dialectically opposed is a program that is truly opposite, truly the opposite of what we presently live in and under. And, it, and in, in that sense, it is very bold to be truly uh, opposite. Now, uh, I went to an earlier panel today, and I, it was a wonderful panel. Um, uh, Lily is back there, and, and Herbert, and David, and they gave an incredibly wonderful panel on uh, the technical, uh, practical way of, of really um, doing what we're talking about here today. Uh, so, uh, true, the Zeitgeist program that we have to offer is not exceptionally new. I, I know there are a lot of new ideas out there, but it is how we put them together that's new. But it, it, is, it is particularly bold and very attractive. I have to say it's very attractive. Now, the left's position has always been attractive. We just don't package it very well. Um, and, but, and, and this uh, Zeitgeist program does offer for us an exciting new social mechanism, however. Uh, it is new, this is new, and that's computer technology. That's, that's uh, uh, what we really call open source computing. Uh, and and I, I'll talk about this more later, but um, open source com community, computing is a, 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 a key to uh, a, a real democracy in the world and, and making uh, this system work. Uh, again, most importantly, what is being offered here is a systematic program. It is not a piecemeal reactive response to whatever the right is up, whatever the right is up to at the moment. It is a proactive program designed to appeal to the widest possible audience. Since it is not a reactive program, uh, it, we, the left, can show ourselves to be in the lead where we deserve to be. We deserve to be. If you want to talk about morality, if you want to talk about rights, you, 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 you know, let's talk about what the left has to offer. So uh, I want to begin now by laying out uh, Zeitgeist basic program attributes, which I might have had are far superior than anything we have to live with today. First, the Zeitgeist program offers a not, now this is, okay, this is the bold part, okay, this, uh, and uh, Johnny referred to it. The Zeitgeist program proposes, and I, you know, maybe you want to write this down. You want to raise questions about this. We need to, we need to talk about this. The Zeitgeist program proposes a non-monetary, non-competitive production system that provides virtually all items available without cost. Now, earlier uh, there was discussion about maybe we need a time bank, and we can discuss that, of course, but. Um, uh, Zeitgeist really proposes that we have a non-monetary, we non-competitive production system, uh, and 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 you know if we need a time bank, we can we can talk about that. A second attribute, the Zeitgeist program proposes uh, a production system that incorporates or deeply integrates recycling and conservation into our production system and totally rejects the mindless, unproductive, and destructive consumption that, dr that drives our present production system. Uh, third, the Zeitgeist program pro proposes a production system that is able to embrace technology without rendering anyone useless. Instead, technology would be used to reduce the obligatory work, perhaps to one or two days a week, we would now be free to use our minds even more. 
we can use our hands less, we can decide on how much we want to do that. Uh, you know, use our minds more, our hands less. We might even have a little time to relax, take a little time off. That would be nice. So, fourth, the Zeitgeist program proposes a production system of planning, of planning, that rapidly and flexibly internalizes scientific advances through open collaboration. This it, open collaboration and the open source computing system makes this possible, makes open collaboration possible, and that makes democracy possible. But this is really a, a new development in human, uh, uh, in, in, in human uh, development, and I, I, you know, it's just an incredible um, uh, new development for all of us. And this open collaboration would have, could eliminate both the rampant secrecy around proprietary information, which is what we uh, the system that we have today. Everything is private, 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 private. So uh, we could eliminate this secrecy around proprietary information and stop all of the bottlenecks that the secrecy creates. The secrecy, um, you know, it's just amazing how how many tricks and uh, of the trade and, and efforts we use to try and to make advantage for ourselves and to um, uh, not not talking about what's good for the community, but what's good for me. Self-interest. We can get a, with open collaborative, um, and we do this because the information, we're able to do this because the information is in the computer system. It is open. It's like a wiki, WikiLeaks. It, uh, the information is provided. We all feed into it. It is open and we don't have um, secrecy around what the information is that we, uh, that has to do with our production system. I'm really talking about production. So, uh, a fifth attribute. The Zeitgeist program proposes a production system that jettisons the, the powerful private interest while advancing public interest. You know, the, the most incredible thing that we, uh, we face today is that private interest is standing in the way of what John was talking about, of getting on to renewable and sustainable forms of energy. Uh, we could. This is the, another key, uh, open source com computing, and another key is virtual free energy. That is possible. It is absolutely technical, po technically, pos technically possible. And if, if we got onto uh, this, uh, a, 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 a new energy system, uh, we, we, the, uh, three seconds of the sun's energy is what we use throughout the year. Okay, we use three seconds of the Earth's energy, the zettajoules that come from the sun. We use three seconds of it for a whole year of our own needs in the entire planet. We, we have so much energy on this planet, wave and, and uh, uh, geothermal, uh, uh, solar. Uh, uh, we have so much energy, but uh, the energy is, is bottlenecked. It, it, it is owned, it is controlled by others, so uh, if this energy was made available, there's just no, there's no stopping what we could do. And, and, and imagine how much we could save in war, war making materials and war and destruction, if we were um, sharing this energy, sharing the production system that, that, uh, and the open source uh, system. So um, the Zeitgeist program promote, proposes um, uh, a, 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 an open source computing system which would eliminate the woefully inact, inadequate and inaccurate price mechanism that we use today. The price mechanism, it, oh, it, it is, there's not a, I, I, an economist on the planet that I, would, that I could imagine would come forth and say that the price mechanism works anywhere really close to what it's supposed to. Theoretically it works, but in practicality, I, I, I don't know of any economist who would say that the price mechanism actually works. So, um, uh, in fact, the open source computing system is an incredible example of what Marx meant 
when he referred to a situation where the means of production have now outstripped present relations of production. The means of production is our open source computing system. And the present relations of production is the private uh, uh, system, the private production system that we have, where we really can't incorporate the, um, uh, the um, open source computing system because uh, we want to keep things quiet, private, owned, uh, in the control of, of a few. So if the left could get behind a program like this, uh, I, I, let's use the, 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 the open source computing system, let's move immediately to, um, uh, to uh, energy sources that, uh, that are virtually free and we want everything to be free anyway. And if we had free energy, we could make, every, could, everything could be virtually free and, 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 and enormous capacities. We would have enormous ability to produce things if we um, uh, got the free energy that is possible. Uh, yeah, I think it would work, but it would, wouldn't be all that much. Uh, so if we were to do this, we could have a system of equal opportunity and general equality, and democracy could become a reality for the first time in human history. There, uh, I, I, we've never had democracy. I, I, I just it's never existed. Uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, something where we get to vote once in a while, and, and, uh, and but. You know, um, it was a really good panel um, about deliberative democracy. If you get a chance, you really need to read about deliberative democracy. That's you know, real democracy, deliberative democracy, where people have the time to come together and to discuss. I hope we have the time. I, need, I probably need to wrap it up, but I, uh, I hope we have the time to discuss what uh, democracy might look like under this system uh, that. Uh, that we're suggesting here. So uh, if we uh, were to get behind this program, we could have a system that could, if quickly implemented, could stabilize the planet and save the human race. Now, I, that, I, I, that to me seems a worthy goal. Uh, you know, uh, it's really incredible. We don't have a whole hell of a lot of time left. Um, uh, 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 meteorologists, uh, scientists who, are, uh, who know the industry are telling us that, well, uh, even some predictions are that we've got um, uh, a 50-50 chance of being here beyond uh, the end of this century. 50-50 chance of being here beyond this century. This is outrageous. And it's all as a result of the private profit system, the private uh, information system, uh, uh, you know, the private uh, concern system. That it, it just, this is maddening, folks. So uh, if, if we were to get behind a program like this, I mean get behind it, talk about it, talk to other people, push it, say, say that, you know, okay, you don't believe, you don't think it's possible, let's discuss it, let's talk about it. Uh, so uh, we can have a system of social uh, uh, and public power that rules over private power. It's not to say that there shouldn't be any private power, but we could have a system where uh, private power is not ruling over us. We could have a system where long-term calculation uh, rules over short-term calculation. A system of efficiency through planned production as opposed to planned obsolescence. My God, we waste so much, it's incredible. We, uh, half the world's um, uh, food production or 40% of the world's food production is wait, thrown away because people don't have money for it. This is, this is morally bankrupt of the highest order. So um, uh, we, we can have a system of recycling and conservation, renewables. Uh, we, could, we could throw out this idea of a, of a welfare state, a denigrating welfare state. That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard coming from the left. A welfare state. We don't need a welfare state. We need production for free for, for people to have have access. We don't need people going begging for anything. We, they, this is really outrageous that, that people have, have to uh, denigrate themselves 
and, 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 um, and, and make themselves feel uh, useless and worthless because they have, to, they have to ask for help. This is outrageous. There is no, no call for this at all. So um, I, um, I probably need to wrap it up uh, and uh, other people and we want, I'd like to have, I want to have time for a, a conversation. Uh, our goal here at Zeitgeist guys is to optimize technical efficiency, meet human needs directly, and create the highest level of abundance possible within the bounds of earthly sustainability. So can we can we just have endless everything? No, but we can have more than enough that where we can live a, a dignified and, and an enjoyable life. And as you know, the capitalists have stolen almost everything. And they're hard at work at what little bit is, is left and remaining. So I was reminded by an old English nursery rhyme that goes something like this. They hang the man and flog the woman who steal the goose from off the common. But the other man they let loose who steal the common from the goose. The capitalists have to go. They have to. They have to go. A new system has to come in. We cannot continue this. This way. Thank you. And for this new system to come in, the system that we acknowledge represents a symbiotic relationship between human beings and our planet. It's important to recognize that we also need to recognize a symbiotic relationship between each other and between ourselves as individuals. And so to talk more about this value shift and this understanding about a symbiotic relationship between each other, ourselves, and our planet, Chris Reed. Hi, thank you so much for letting me speak this evening. I'd like to first begin by giving a brief overview of two core Zeitgeist Movement concepts that are directly related to, these, to this value shift that I want to discuss. Um, the first is train of thought. Through the use of socially targeted research and tested understandings in science and technology, we are now able to logically arrive at societal applications that could profoundly and more effectively in the meeting of the needs of human population and increasing public health. There is little reason to assume war, poverty, most crime, and many other monetarily based society, scarcity effects excuse me, common in our current model cannot be resolved over time. The second one is unity. The Zygast movement has no allegiance to country or traditional political platforms. It views the world as a single system and the human species as a single family and recognizes that all countries must disarm and learn to share their resources and ideas if we expect to survive in the long run. Hence, the solutions arrived at and promoted are at the interest to help everyone on Earth, not a select group. So let's focus on change. The Zygast movement recognizes that in addition to complete overhaul of the current economic infrastructure, our values must change in according to the conjunction with that change. As an advocate for change, particularly for the change of the way we think and view ourselves in relation to the world around us, if we change our process of thought individually based on a set personal goal to enhance ourselves and our thoughts for the well-being of all humans, then and only then can we see change in society. In focusing on change, we must keep in mind that humans have limitless possibilities and are able to secure results desired if acted upon strategically. Thus, what we may consider a utopian society or a social system that may seem completely out of reach today can be attainable through strategic, system-based, and on a collective of all knowledge that we have access to. Systemic thinking. In systemic thinking, a system is composed of inter interrelated parts or components that cooperate in processes of our behavior. Natural systems include biological entities, ocean currents, climate, the solar system, and ecosystems. Design systems include airplanes, software systems, technologies and machines of all kinds, government agencies, and business systems. As Stafford Beer notes, 
the purpose of a system is what it does. It is clear that the current system we live in is and has been reinforcing malice intentionally and unintentionally. We can see this reinforcement through the results of war, poverty, climate change, and environment destruction, as well as mental and physical health diseases. If one wants to understand the causes of these societal issues, they must examine the correlation between the actions of humans and these societal issues. There are numerous studies and evidence that show the direct link of the behavior of humans and the current issues that we are facing. In order to eliminate these effects of the human's actions in the hope of implementing more sustainable society, aside from moving to the moon, there is a dire need for each individual to completely reform their thinking and mental action to improve the human condition. The more we acknowledge the mental action in relation to the personal action, the more we can change ourselves and in turn change the world. Because if we want to move to the moon, we would still have to already have changed our behavior and personal thought process to avoid our own destruction. I'd like to um, acknowledge the spiritual connection, which is the change in that personal thinking by introducing a spiritual connection between ourselves and our thoughts. The term spiritual is and has been a sensitive topic due to its lack of definitive definition, but I chose that term for this very reason. It is not for or against any definitive way of thought, thus by nature can resonate with me. It also allows for the individual to form their own personal relevance to the subject. However, I'd like to be clear that I, nor is the Zeitgeist Movement advocating any organized religion, as those institutions have historically exploited people's desire to build upon the spiritual awareness for monetary and other gains, oftentimes being a part of the cause rather than the solution. In exploring the spiritual connection, this is based on a view that deals with non-religious spirit of humans. Being more interested in the root word spirit, which is defined as the inner self, principles, or motivating force, the spirit or motivating force is needed for all humans to change their process of thinking based on a set personal goal to enhance oneself and system of thinking for the well-being of all. The set goal must be linear to the promotion of growth and continuous advancement of the human condition, all beings and life itself. Human spiritual awareness is that self-conscious connection to life and the universe. In essence, humans will have to adopt a systematic way of thought when attempting to change the way humans process their own thoughts and actions. We are all a part of a system, and ourselves, we are a system. Let's connect the dots between that system's thinking and the spiritual connection. Through the connection, we can use all the tools that humans have, all of which we know about society, human behavior, the environment, and the universe, to apply that knowledge strictly for the advancement of the entire planet and every individual inhabitant. We can no longer assume that one way is the right way. We must consider everything. In considering everything, I'd like to mention symbiosis. It is the interdependent relationship of everything. When we consider interactions that link these perceived categorical systems together, we find a connection of everything on a societal level. This system interaction understanding is the foundation of likely the most viable perspective for true human sustainability. The human being, like the tree or the earth, on the surface appears self-contained. Yet without oxygen to breathe, one will not survive. This means that the human system requires an interaction with this atmospheric system and hence a system of oxygen production. And since the process of photosynthesis accounts for the majority of the atmospheric oxygen we breathe, it is our advantage to be aware of what affects this particular system and to work and harmonize our social practices with it. The goal is a sustainable production of growth and a human condition. Promoting growth. We can only move forward 
The human condition must advance, so why must we continue to reject the eternal advancement by continuing in a manner in direct opposition of that advancement? Thank you. Are there any socialists in the room? <laughs> All right. You're going to love this one. Uh, Saul Marcus, a member of the movement, was a former socialist, and he would like to talk about the relationship between socialism and a natural law resource-based economy and what the two can offer each other, if anything. So, Saul Marcus. Um, this, this is going to be a Marxist presentation. I'm not critiquing Marx. I'm just explaining concepts in the Zeitgeist movement using Marx. Um, just before we get into it, if you walk around here today, one of the things that you would see is people advocating a minimum wage of $15 an hour. So are you all aware of that? Uh, it's like, how many people support that? I mean, everyone, right? Yeah. But now, on the surface, if we want to think on superficial and reductionistic manner, you can say people are being exploited, they're not being paid enough, we have to have pay them more. But, and within a narrow context, in a truncated point of view that makes sense. These people should be paid more. And yes, I support a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Yeah. However, we're going, to, we're going to go through this analysis where we step back and see that paying people more than a minimum wage will not do anything whatsoever to really affect the core systemic problems within our system. <laughs> I'm going to start this very simply. Now, some very basic Marxist terms. This is Marxism 101, so there's not much here. The goal of the capitalist is to take money, turn it into a commodity, and then sell that commodity for more money, right? That's like the most basic Marxist equation. And within this is two things. There's different values. There's a use value, right? That's the actual use of the object being made. And then there's the exchange value. That's what it's exchange value. So that's what it's worth. There's also something called price, which is different than Marxism, but we're not going to get into that. But the idea is you say, work. what? That's because it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, well, price yeah, it's outside the scope of this. Um, in the use value, you can have something that has a, you're supposed to make something that has a use in the physical of the world, like um, linen. Anyone know where I get that from? So this is what the capitalist is trying to do. But we have certain problems when we use advanced technology, and certain things Marx pointed out, certain, certain things just were not around in his day. Marx was not writing in the age of automation. Now, one thing that happens is the capitalist is compelled by the system to try to make things cheaply in order to compete. So you want to use technology to produce more. But there's a, some certain problems with that. Uh, we, one of the contradictions of capitalism is when you produce more with less, the price, the actual exchange value decreases. Because Marx went through great detail to show that the only thing that really creates exchange value is human labor. And that's the basic labor theory of value. That when humans labor, that imbues stuff with value as long as it's creating something that's socially necessary. So socially necessary labor increases value. Something else here is kind of what happens when advanced technology is removing jobs. And we're going to talk about technological unemployment and what happens. As much as the capitalist is trying to use technology so you don't have to, so you don't have to pay people, the only way the capitalist can make any money is to exploit labor. Because the only thing that creates exchange value is human labor. So the capitalist is compelled to come up with ways to get people to work to exploit them. So we can use different examples to start showing problems that come up with advanced technology. If it's 1860 and people are making linen in a factory, they're making something with an actual use value. Now linen is just going to wear out on its own. You're making something that's going to be depleted. So the capitalist just has to figure out how to get people to work to make the linen, you sell it, and this machinery is running. You don't have to worry so much about what if the linen doesn't wear out. But what happens if you have advanced technology so the product you're making does not need to um, wear out, that it can last 100 years? Obviously, the capitalist has no incentive to do that because then you can't sell it again. 
If the capitalist produces something that just lasts, well, then you can no longer exploit human labor to sell it again. So using this simple analysis, you see that the capitalists, as much as they want to use less human labor to produce stuff, they need to come up with ways to use human labor. So if we go to like a Foxconn factory out in China where they're making iPads, maybe you can say you should pay the workers there $15 an hour instead of who knows whatever they're making. Maybe we should give them an eight-hour workday or a four-hour workday. But when Apple and Foxconn are making that iPad, they have to make sure the iPad breaks. Because if the iPad doesn't break, that means that you can't hire those people again to make a new iPad in two years. Because if you're not exploiting those people, there is no profit. Now, when we go into this thing with use value, this is where our system is really going to start to break down. And then we're going to show how stupid our society is right now and the types of things people are doing for work. Because the dumbest thing people ever say is that we need jobs. That's the most asinine thing in the world. So if we go with the iPad, remember the, and this is just going to get dumber and dumber. The linen has a real use value. Now, they both have exchange value. The capitalist does not care about the use value whatsoever. The use value is meaningless. The only thing that matters is producing something which, with an exchange value. Linen, shoes, a bicycle has an actual use value with reference to the physical world. It's a real thing. If we take something like an iPod, iPad, whatever, you can say, oh, that has a real use value with reference to the physical world. Yes, but if you can make an iPad that just lasts 100 years, you're creating, you don't need that labor anymore. So what's the rationale in giving people jobs making something that's going to break in two years when you can just make it and have it last 100 years? So we can see that the labor isn't needed. So it's nice to give people more money, pay them better, they're not going to be exploited as much, but they're still in a system that's inherently <coughs> exploitative. But as bad as the iPad is, with the intrinsic obsolescence, let's go to dumber jobs. Because what our society is doing right now is in this hyper mode, creating bullshit for people to do, in order for the excuse of having a job. And then I want to point out where, where I'm not really a socialist. I'm a Marxist, but I'm not a socialist, because it drives me crazy when people will start trying to use 1860s models for current technology. So let's say the product isn't linen, it's not an iPad, let's say it's a commercial. You're producing something for TV because you want to convince men that if they buy poor beer, they're going to have sex with lots of women. And the uh, people at the advertising agency, the people behind the cameras, the people writing that stuff, the, the, the people doing graphic design for that commercial, to make that commercial, they are all producing a commodity that has a use value and exchange value with reference to selling people beer based upon psychological manipulation. But when it comes to the real physical world and what type of thing, objective things do people objectively need, there is no physical reference for a commercial selling beer on TV. There's no reason why that should ever be created. So going on and saying that these people who are making garbage that has no use value except as except within the system of capitalism, then what's the point of that? Use value should be things that things should be made because there's a real use for them, not because it's part of a game. If you look at the jobs that are being made, there are whole sectors where the only reason why there is a use value for it is because we're in capitalism. And if you look at prisons, what's the use that is like the commodity is to get a prison cell. Why do you create something like that? So the idea that we have to pay people money to create use values that really shouldn't be made in the first place, that's, that's the absurdity. And when socialists go on that the working class needs to do this and needs to do that, within a, the, the narrow context of working class struggle today, get emphasized that and we can support it. But the drive has to be to take an evolutionary step somewhere. The socialist can't, if this, that's fine, but if you have a socialist who's just, is not focused on socialism, or however they want to define it, but they're just focused on making life better for people within the current system, then where are you going? Because the $15 an hour minimum wage, as much as it help people, it's really, you know, it's not going to change anything. And I hope that maybe this makes sense if people are familiar with uh, Marx.
Um, do I have anything else? Um, I think, you know, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Saul. Uh, lesson. Up next, we have Bakari Pace uh, to, to add a little more about our perspectives on democracy. Thank you. Um, so, I think, based on where the panel has been thus far, it feels almost like we've uh, gaffled you because we haven't really talked about democracy. Um, I wanted to do a little exercise with you on this panel over there. Most of you must be the pro or against democracy, wondering why we're beyond democracy, so can I get a sense of like some words that you think of when you hear the word democracy? So just shout some out with words that you bring up. What are those words? Electoral college. Electoral college? Electoral college? Okay. People power. Legal power. Legal power. Legal power. Legal power. Legal power. Legal power. People power. Freedom. Default voting machine. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like our current democracy. Not much. Like the current? Democracy. That one's not working. Yeah, that one's a little bad. Uh, so we have freedom, people, power. What else? Come on, let me let me get like Quality. ten words. Ten Liberty. Words. People, power, electoral college, freedom, capitalism, American Senate, huh? politics, politics, voting, politics, equality, equality. One person, one vote. Self-determination, capitalism. <laughs> so you feel that uh, democracy is very tied up to, to capitalism. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's good? No? State power. State power. So, what I'll now, I would argue that the words from this very highly educated group of people mostly related to political power, right? The decision to where to put per, where to put somebody to make a decision for in the political structure, right? But it doesn't really have any much much to do with the economic structure itself. Right? Well, people power does. People power has connected to the, I guess people power, yeah, you have to you vote with your dollars. Right? Yeah, I mean, that, it can be definitely mean, but just based on the general spread of the words, right? This general spread of the words is mostly related to political structure. It's not really into the economic structure. That's where the zeitgeist movement is really talking. That's where we. That's where we're discussing about beyond democracy. So most of the time, when we think about making decisions, we think about the environment, the, the political side. But what about things like production? What about things like distribution and where these things should go? Where, where, how to make a how to make a toy? What are the best ways to make a toy? What are the best tools that we should use to make a toy? Where should we extract resources from? Where should we do anything related to the economic system? Not where should, where should we where should we place somebody in uh, in, uh, in in power? That should. Not should somebody you know represent the 31st district in some some place in Florida, but where should we get our minerals to put into our iPads, right? Um, if we're getting those minerals from a place that is not connected, that that is uh, that doesn't that's not connected to our regenerative process, so we're just de destroying the land to get that te that technology. We're getting that they're getting that resource and we can create that technology, but it has it's no it's not connected to the ecology in any sense, any sense of the word. Then we're only thinking when we think about democracy in this sense, just in the state, just in the state power, just in the sense of in the way that the political structure works. So when we talk about democracy, we're really when we're talking about beyond democracy, we're saying how can we change the decision making power? How do we decide to make decisions outside of just where to put people or where to get our resources from? So the, the very nature of our uh, our economic system, the economic system that we talk about, but a resource based economy. So let me get a sense, just based on these words from this very well educated group of people, what do you think of when you see those those three words? I'm assuming most people have this one of the first times you've ever seen this 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 combination of words put together, right? No. No. Artificially induced scarcity. Artificially induced scarcity. <coughs> That's a lot of words. 
officially yeah, there we go. Um, some other words? <coughs> Give me, go ahead, go ahead, just throw them out. I just want to just clarify one thing. It sure. seems to me all economies throughout history, uh -huh. early that they then, were all resource based? Yes. So that's where a little comes in a little confusion, right? So we have, so the guy who founded this, 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 this phrase, uh, this man named Jacques Fresco, he lives in Venus, Florida. Um, he adapted this uh, economic system from a group of people, um, you would call the Technocracy Inc. Te um, of, the 19, of the 1930s. I'm not sure, there may be a lot of people who are familiar with that. Oh, they came back in the 1980s? Okay, that's interesting. I'll look into that. But um, so in the 1930s, there was a huge explosion of people who were interested in connecting the economic system directly to the ecological system. That's all they wanted to solve. <laughs> they said based on the based on the technical parameters, based on what we knew, and they were only interested in North America, we have expanded this definition to include the entire world. But based on their understanding in the 1920s, this was a lot of very, very well educated um, techn um, technicians and economists from the 1920s and 1930s. This is Thorsten Veblen, who is the founder of the New School, amongst many other things. He wrote a fascinating book called, uh, what's, what's, do you know the name of his book? Uh, Thorsten Veblen. Anybody know the name of his book? Theory of the Theory of the Leisure Mind. There you go. So you actually should definitely check into that. What's his um, name? Thorsten Veblen. Thorsten Veblen. Yeah. Thorsten. Yeah. D-E-V-L-E-N. Exactly. He founded a new school. He was a technocrat. He was involved in this process of trying to figure out how to relate the economic system directly to the technical system. And based on what the technocrats found out, based on this research that they did, this was these are professors at Columbia. These are, um, one of the professors was the work with Einstein. They came up that just within the North American continent there was, and this was the, this is the title of my first book, enough for all. They figured that out in 1930, just in North America, based on the based on the technology of that time. Now, a hundred years later, we're not living in a world where we relate our economic system to our social system. Excuse me, we relate our economic system to our ecology. We don't have that symbiosis, and that's what the resource-based economic system is about. One of the very big words that are phrases that's within inside of the uh, inside of the, the Zeitgeist Movement, and uh, it's a related organization called the Venus Project. One of the um, one of the major term, um, t uh, terms that we use is a word, a word called dynamic equilibrium. So, excuse me. Oh, I mean, you can go for it. No, well, I was you were mentioning about the Venus Project. Yeah. When I read, watched the uh, video, they were talking about how which video? Did you the Venus Project introduction. Okay. Um, they're discussing yeah. how there's a equal distribution of resources um, amongst the citizens. Yeah. Um, so area. the the most important thing that has to happen with an with a resource based economy the first the the overall purpose of this, the, an economic system of this, of, of this type, is to make sure that everybody has access to everything um, within a certain boundary, right? So, you, so um, what's a, a, a good way to explain this? Does anybody know anything about exponential growth? Anybody have a sense of what exponential growth is? Sure. I do a, sure. Oh, of course you do, Stuart. Um, uh, let me give it a, 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 a brain teaser that might, that might uh, give a good demonstration of this. So if I, take, uh, if I take four linear steps, right? So one, two, three, four, I would walk this far, right? But if I take four exponential steps, meaning four steps that, grow, that double by each time, I would be outside of that rule, right? So my first step would be this size, and then the, the amount of space between this step and that step would be the second step. So my third step would be double more and even farther, either farther than four. If you take 16 steps like that, you could move the moon, right? So that's the idea of how much technology is moving. That's the, that's the quickening of technology and our ability to access resources. So when we say that we have enough for all forever, we're saying we have enough resources on the planet based on the exponential growth in our ability to access that technology. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is connect our ability to access that technology with a sense of dynamic equilibrium, meaning that we connect our ecological system to the, to, to, we connect our economic system to the ecology. So we don't just end up over our society with tons of different things that are just, 
disastrous for the ecology. So, and that's the, the way in which that we'd be able to make sure that everybody has access to things, because once you have it in excess, you're able to make sure that everybody has enough. So that's just a good sense of what, why we chose the, the phrase of beyond democracy, is that we don't necessarily want to only think about democracy in the lens of political power and where to put individual, where to put individuals and where, what, you know, just in the general sense of the way in which we uh, connect our sense of what democracy is. Well, we've come to realize that we all live on one planet. We are, uh, we're, um, we're contained inside of the planet, so what happens on another part of the planet affects us individually. So we need to make sure that our economy is also thought of when we're thinking about democracy. So that's my thought. Thank you. Now we'd like to open it up for the Q&A. You can take maybe two or three questions at a time. We'll allow for more questions and then the panel can catch them. Wow, let's start. Do it. Um, to Saul. So if one temporarily uh, allows the possibility that the labor survey of value is not necessarily a given, just temporarily, uh, why, uh, uh, unless we, and once we realize that automation can be constructed to learn from and even, uh, to learn from human behavior and essentially replicate it, including the ability to make errors on a random basis. So given that, why is, why would human labor be necessary to create the value structures you mentioned? Um, I think, strictly speaking, um, if technology increases according to this, the actual, what the exchange value should be of commodities would actually start to kind of approach zero. And you'll find other people talk about this, that the price of goods really should approach zero. Um, what you end up having is then the capitalists would institute artificial scarcity to keep um, right. the price of goods off. And that's artificial scarcity could take the place of intentional obsolescence, even though it's machine produced. Yeah, they, okay. yeah, so, thank you. Um, thank you. I, I have a couple of kind of overview, broader questions. I mean, one is, I'd like to hear a little bit more about kind of the roots of the thinking where, what are some of the sources that have been pulled together or how, over what kind of time frame, what, um, that kind of stuff. Um, as well as geographically, I'd be interested where the ideas are coming from. Um, and, um, in relation to what you said, I wanted to, I feel like it happened, but it happened very quickly. I'm wondering if you can say more about how you understand, how, what the understanding is about how, there was kind of a process you talked about, about like individual change needing to create societal change, but then it leaves open the question is of how individual change occurs. Um, and, um, and then I also around the basic programmer attributes, the more I listened, the more I felt like actually, I didn't understand how they were attributes, I thought that they were more goals, uh, or a vision, or something like that. And I'd be interested to hear more of the how. What is the idea of the process? One more. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, this one you guys made questions. To start off, I just came from $15 as a on the panel, so that kind of hurt my feelings. But um, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to trying to make this a global um, system, like how exactly are you trying to go about convincing these other countries into joining up when there's so many um, hostilities and international treaties that are in place that they're not willing to go very easily? A and B. The second question is, is that there's actually a lot of smaller communities um, built around a country as it is that are creating. Uh, permaculturally sound uh, systems and using these other like uh, aquaponics and and vertical growing and all these systems that are already been introduced through many of the studies that um, I'm sure you guys have already read. Um, but the question is like, how do you go about convincing these people to join a larger um, system when a lot of them have already created these community, you know, smaller community-based um, systems where they're not they're not willing to just jump on board with a larger um, system that you're now trying to introduce and then try to create that into an even global thing. Like, how would you go about 
convincing people that this is possible. When, based on what she said, or she is, the how. Um, so the this is very this is a very broad estimate, but uh, the cost for seventeen thousand desalinization plants would be in the area of uh, approaching a um, thousand, you know, with two thousand trillion dollars. Since they go for roughly between uh, know, roughly 500 million and 1.5, no, I'm sorry, 15, they can cost about 20 billion dollars uh, a piece. Is that correct, or is that over? Is, is that overstated? So it's about a billion. So 500 million to all right. So I'm off. So it's still, but it's still a pretty um, expensive venture. So that, that's really the question: where that comes from, where that where that influx of capital under the, under the of money present comes from. system. Yeah, it's a lot yeah, of money. yeah, exactly. So it's really, not a lot back of money to the how. That's not my question. I have a different how question. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But it's another how question, is what I mean. Do you want to take your question about like the root of the movement, the oh, and the sources and stuff? He's a great oh. historian. Oh, oh sure. Um, so. So you have like, you have a bunch of people for like, for, uh, at least like in the in the early like 1800s, who were concerned about ecological problems and economic problems, but they weren't really dovetailing in any in any kind of way. And then um, around like the 1920s is when you have democracy, uh, excuse me, um, technocracy Inc. really come into like it, it has like this huge explosion but only for one year, I believe it's 1933. Um, in 1933 they were founded and almost like immediately they had like a harsh reaction. A lot of Marxists came out who were very against them. A lot of people were very against the technocracy movement, but it, it got like a lot of like underground coverage, especially in the New York area. So that's where it was founded in New York City. Um, it was founded by a man named uh, Howard, Man, I forget the Howard's last name. What's Howard's last Wasn't name? Wasn't Theodore Roosevelt involved? In no, no, no. no. Um, um, his first name is Howard. If you no, type in Howard at Technocracy, you'll find Also, was also involved. He was? Well, I believe uh, he was I, very concerned. I, 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 this is my, my first appearing here. Okay. So, um, the Howard uh, was a close friend of Thorsten Veblen. Um, they had a lot of arguments around this time about how the um, society should be operated. But they were mostly only considering this in the context of the Great Depression, um, because a lot of people were trying to find answers to the Great Depression, and technocracy it was uh, proposed. And one of the major reasons why it got so much attention was because they were willing to say democracy is not the best way to operate the uh, economic system. Um, the capitalists have completely messed up the, uh, the. What we need to do is transition and give the, the let the. Um, the decision-making process happened through science and happened through tech, uh, with over the guidance of uh, technicians. Um, a very young, maybe like 14, 15-year-old kid from Brooklyn heard about this idea. Um, his name was Jock. He uh, he was really impressed by what he heard, and he took the idea on. He kept it, and he kept interacting with Howard and many of the other people inside of the. Um, Inside of the organization, um, around 2008, that 14 year old was like 94, and he had an opportunity to be interviewed by um, an impressive filmmaker named Peter Joseph. And Peter Joseph put him in his film, and as a result, um, him and his organization, which is called the Venus Project, uh, got a lot of attention and, and probably the cause for why we're all here today. Howard Scott. Howard Scott. There you go. One, one second. So, and then you in the back. Um, what was your name? I'm sorry. Rain. Well, we didn't get all the answer questions. Answer. No, no, no. I'm, I'm answering the question. Oh, she had a question. Oh. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I've spent like the past maybe two and a half years researching this information, and um, I realized very quickly that I'm going to have to spend like the rest of my life trying to make that information <laughs> resonate with various types of people and cultures. Um, I was in Uganda a couple of years ago talking about the movement and trying to you know, explain it to her. And she just kept telling me that this sounds too Eurocentric. You know, it's just too Western, too Eurocentric. 
And it was probably my fault. I mean, obviously there's nothing Eurocentric about, you know, taking an inventory of the world's resources and then trying to extract them strategically to meet the needs of the human population. But maybe it was just because the narrator was a white voice, like the models of Jack Fresco were white people, and it, it sounds a lot like imperialism. You know, it sounds a lot like a Western culture imposing their ideas on, on indigenous people, which has been happening for hundreds of years. You know, that's what she said to me. And I realized, man, I have to go back and, and now I need to research how to articulate these ideas. So, you know, if you want to add to that, that's great. You know, thank you. I don't be answered just yet. Um, and how they would operate their own permaculture um, economies on a smaller scale within an RPD, it's going to be very possible. We're not, no one is, no one, the, the number one, you know, thing about this movement is that it's not going to be imposed on anyone. And if you don't want to participate, you don't have to participate. If that means it doesn't come about, then I'm, unfortunately that means it doesn't come about. But if we did have a global resource-based economy, um, or a natural law resource-based economy, which is based on a regenerative process of resources that we extract and we wait for them to grow back, right? Because, I mean, capitalism is based on resources. Everything is based on resources. But do they acknowledge the resources? Um, if they're in a global RPG and they want to have their own communities within that, that's going to be perfect. Like, it's going to be perfect. I know that. Um, individual change. Maybe you want to get individual change. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I would um, talk about individual thought and the systemic um, thinking to promote the human condition. So that's changing, actually making the decision to change your mind about the way we think about things. What we are advocating is a complete overhaul of the current system. And in order for us to actually have a complete overall, overhaul of that system, we have to change the way we think about uh, money and monetary gain. Currently, a lot of the decisions are made based upon monetary gain. And a lot of people have their values strictly based on monetary gain. If we're taking out completely monetary gain, then we're going to have to change the way we think about moving forward or sustainability, or production, or even the con human condition and growth. I don't know if that answered your question. That's, that's, and, and how is, is as one of those multifaceted things, as humans are multifaceted, we have so many different ways that we can change that thinking. And there's no, you know, one set way of changing the thinking, but the, the goal has to be set. And that is the sustainable promotion of the growth of the human um, condition. I'd like to say, regarding to the question of how are we going to convince others, um, uh, I, I'm not sure we've convinced everyone here. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, the only thing we can do is study the, the um, the attributes or the goals, and I'll come to that in a minute, but uh, we study uh, what we, the principles that, uh, that's systemically being presented and present them to others as honestly and openly and with as open heart as we can possibly do. And as uh, John said, John said, if people don't accept it, if they, uh, uh, if, you, if they just can't get their mind around it, then it, we're probably doomed, you know, we're probably finished. Uh, uh, the present system is, is unsustainable. Uh, so um, hopefully we'll be successful, there's no guarantee. Now, uh, I, and I, I know you want to respond to something, but I wanna, I, I'm not sure the difference between attribute and, and goal, um, and, uh, these are, to me these are characteristics or attributes, uh, in other words, having a, uh, a society where we do not charge uh, anything for the system, for the, right, uh, through production. Um, we don't, um, you know, we produce, uh, uh, we, we pursue uh, 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 public interests as over um, private interests. Those just seem like attributes to me uh, of the system, um, uh, and they are goals as well, I suppose. I'm not sure what the difference, how that, 
we come out all that different. I'm just not sure about that, but but I'm responding to it. But um, I know the, you in the very back wanted to respond to I think everything else was being said. And, and can I just say that you would be next? You would be next, uh, uh, Herbert, and then I, you, I can totally uh, wait until after. So. Oh, okay. So so who go ahead? Let me go now. Well, Her, Herbert. Go ahead. Herbert, you want to? Right. Can I make a few comments? Sure. Just look at this resource based idea. And I'm all for resources being conserved and used intelligently and mm -hmm. with our brains so we don't deplete them. We only have one planet. Right. And we have a limited amount of resources. Some are renewable, some aren't. But uh, I'm looking at this resource-based economy. R resources aren't an economy. You have to transfer resources into an economy. And that's done through human labor, through right. history. Labor is the source of all wealth. It, it's, it's the source of transferring resources <clears throat> to anything we want to make whether it's for use value or exchange value or whatever. It's that transference that we should be very much interested in. And who owns this transference? Who owns this resource-based economy? Right now, it's owned by 1%. Mm -hmm. And we have no say-so in it, in its use, or whatever we produce. Right. So we need a system. and. A, Sure, we're on the same blank. Where we, the 99%, control the product that's being made, Absolutely. how we want to use it, how we want to distribute it, how we want to use our resources. And we need power for that. And we can't have that power as long as the 1% own the economy. Well, excuse me, sir, when you say the 1%, do you include just corporation? Do you also include I'm the government? About, uh, yeah, no, I'm talking about. Both. Let's put it. Let's put the government as part, an agent, part okay. of, right. of the corporation structure. But it's the capitalist class right. that own the means of production. And don't be so quick to throw Carl off in your analysis. <laughs> it still holds up a, a lot. Carl Marx. You know, and in the gentleman's, in the gentleman's. Uh, <laughs> Thing. It's, it's money, commodity, money. Remember, it's labor that's exploited to produce that com commodity and has to be sold on a market for that capitalist to make money. But it's not money, it's profit. It's not money, it's profit. So, however you want it. You want to have uh, cocoa beans for as a medium exchange and you'll get eight coconut beans and you'll get one as a wage worker. It doesn't matter what the medium of exchange is, it's the idea of exploitation of labor. That's our problem. And let's take this technology idea that he brought up. Technology. Who made the technology? Who made the machine? The working class. Who designed the machines? The working class. Who designed the machine before that machine? That machine that made that machine. The labor power. Your labor power, my labor power, all of us is mental and physical. We want rewarded, in, as Marx said, inherent in every technology is the past labor. The latest gizmo is past labor, past energy embodied and in, congealed into that object. Excuse me? Yeah, what's My point is that we need a system that we control the product that we produce. And we distribute it and own it and decide all we want to do. And, and this is all great, but it has to be transferred into an economy, into a way of sustaining ourselves.
That's all. Ooh, I'll just do it. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did. I did. I did. Know, you know how we can control it? My you know how? Why is it all the My turn. Why is it all the why is the, here's the question. Why is the labor theory of production outdated? I'll give an answer back. Because in this system, if I got it right, you don't need money anymore. And then I'll go away. One second. One second. One second. Let's let Saul respond. Okay. Then bring it right over to the I don't disagree with Marx and labor theory of value. I completely support it. It is 100% correct. The labor theory of value upholds for the capitalistic mode of production. That's what it's designed to explain. And you know, historically, people would debunk it by trying to apply it to other areas. And when Marx wrote in a time where he did not have to consider certain factors. I don't want to throw out the labor theory of value, and I basically agree with what you say. What I do want to say is we need to add in certain factors that Marx didn't have to consider, and that unfortunately I think many socialists will just repeat the strategies going back 150 years. Of course, I agree. We have to bring it up to date. And yes. We have to apply that to our conditions. Yes. Um, just a couple of what Marx specifically did not have to contend with, automation, he knew technology was going to get better, but no one back then had any idea what was going to happen with computers. All right, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just answer one question on that. Robotization today. We have robots that make cars, but we only need one guy up there pushing a button. All right? What happens under capitalism when we have robotization? We lay off workers who go on welfare, can't buy anything because they don't long to receive a wage. But in a real, true economic democracy where we own all the means of production, How do you get there? Wait, a, wait, wait a minute, let me just tell you, say this. That technology would not, we wouldn't need as many workers, we'd have much more leisure time. Of course. Now that's the rational way to look at technology. So of course, I, I just said that, I said that. I, I, said that. I, I, we, I can't read, but I totally agree. Okay, all right. We're told, yeah. told the individual has a private property, corporate share of a robot that produces, you get money. So let's make everybody a private sector owner of capital and means to form capital to give everybody ownership as a way of distributing. Well, why don't we just socially Why don't we just socially I'm sorry, order. I'm sorry. This is a facilitated discussion and they're running it. Yeah, and oh, okay. Well, yes. Yeah. I'm just yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. It's all right. All right. I, I had, had to little comment. Little it's okay, but. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had some comments. Well, I, I, would like to, I would like to say yeah. that the way that we control, the 99% uh, right. of us control these resources and right. the productive right, right. apparatus that we've produced up to this point in time, right. the way we control it is going to be through an open source computing right. system where we feed in all the right. information, the, uh, the information about what we need, about what we, uh, uh, what we want, what we're, what we're capable, what we have, right. all of that is, and, and that is a, that's, anybody participates, everybody participates. Yeah, but I think now, so now it's true, it's true that it, you know, getting the capitalists to go along with that is, is another story. Well, was, but that's how it would be controlled by all of us. Um, <laughs> the only way that you are going to have anything to sustainable is to get people, all people, in, involved in the decision making. If you have a program that you decide is going to do that and you go to impose it, it's never going to work. Absolutely. Ever, ever, ever. Absolutely. And, and what he's saying is, is fine and, and right about labor, but you have to start at the, you have to start at the planning. You can't have anything already planned. You've got to be flexible enough to say, okay, and listen to every single person. You gather groups, you get focus groups or consulting groups or whatever, and you get them grassroots, and you organize, and you organize, and you organize. Absolutely. Because that's the only way that it's going to work. Because you cannot impose, you cannot say that this is going to work because it won't work until everybody buys into it. Every single person along the way. And it's really hard. It's really, really hard to do that. Correct. Yes, I think knowledge is power, and there should be, in order for uh, to have a democracy at work, there must be enough power, of, especially from the bottom up, mm -hmm. to have the knowledge to be able to effect a, a effective change 
but also there must be a collective, enough people like a laser, enough people, a group, get together to have to to be able to effect their their uh, their decision to the people with the so-called upper management. No, there must people have to be engaged. If people are not engaged, we we'll get nowhere. Nowhere. Um, I, Pop, I feel like uh, I'm still forgetting the very the essence of what the panel is about. The reason why it's beyond democracy is really to talk about a different way of making decisions. That's that was the whole purpose of why democracy is being put on the table as a question mark, or why we would want to discuss being going beyond it. And that was the reason for why I did the exercise up there, where I pointed at these are the way in which that we define democracy. Very and that's a very good. Actually, very good process. What you just did was a very good process, and it's a way to begin your grassroots organizing everywhere and pull it out. You pull it out. You That's cannot right. impose anything. Absolutely. No. You cannot. You, you otherwise, it it goes. It just gets destroyed in the process. Everybody gets upset. If there was a goal that I had really to. Probably it's probably wrong for me to put resource-based economy or enough for all for yeah. economic and that for everyone. It was really to point at a decision-making process that is beyond democracy, and that's in the, in the realm of science. Science is a very strict as a very strict way in which we come come to discover answers. We we first we first have make an hypothesis. We think that this is going to happen. Maybe this will happen. I think. I think excuse, excuse me. We start with an observation. And then we get to a hypothesis. When we have a hypothesis, we make we make an experiment. After that experiment, we make a conclusion. And then after that conclusion, we make we observe that conclusion and make another hypothesis on top of that. That's the, the very essence of why we say beyond democracy. That's relating to uh, the building of products. So, for instance, who make who makes the decisions? The scientific method makes the decisions. We make the decisions based on we make a decision on what's the right resource to use in this context based on what science has given us as an answer. We use that as the very underlying structure for how we consider making decisions. Why it's built? It still goes back to the scientific method. Do we is it that? Still, all these answers come back down to the scientific method, and we use that as our, as our, as our, uh, excuse me, as our, what's the word? Methodology. Uh, not just methodology, but as our, as our measurement, really, for where we decide on where different things are going. That's the reason what that's the very essence of where technocracy was coming from, and that's the reason why the, the language is called tech, technocracy or techno, is because they were very precise on that idea. And this is something that Jacques Fresco, and, and Fresco would probably be very angry inside of this meeting that science has come out maybe like four or five times in this discussion, is because of how important it is really in the way in which we come about making decisions and thinking about our decisions and, and coming, up, coming up and not, and not coming up with answers, not um, finding answers, but arriving at decisions based on that method. Okay, and I want to, can I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just wanted to address the labor theory of value. I don't know if Saul touched on it the way he wanted to. So uh, with the labor theory of value, we're not in any way against it as it applies to this market system. Because if you look at the top here, the money from, what was that, capital? Was the money capital? is converted to commodities. To commodities. It just turns to more money. Turns to more money. That cycle, that cycle is relevant within number one, a monetary system, and number two, a capitalist system. And so everything that derives after that, Marx's perspective on labor theory value, it's all relevant insofar as it's contained within the context of this money system. And the reason why we're beyond this now, we acknowledge, we acknowledge, we acknowledge its relevance in this, in this, in these terms, right? But we're outside of these terms now. And so when he's, we're talking about who gets these resources, well, actually, um, t machines do. Machines do. Technological unemployment is very real. At not not, not even a hundred years ago, the 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 employment of the agrarian ag agricultural sector was at a, like eighty seven percent. Now it's below one percent, and that's because machines are doing the jobs for us. And so, labor theory of value is only relevant insofar as you need humans to do the labor. But now that machines can do the labor for us. We don't really need to hold on to this anymore. Right. Thank you. And exactly. it's that same, and, exactly. and a human made that machine, but a human used the scientific method to make that machine. A human said, let me make a, um, I'm tired of picking this cotton like this. Let me make a machine and try to pick this cotton a little bit easier. And if 
didn't work, they went back and they, uh, they changed something about the process of building that machine and they adapted it to the new model and then eventually it worked and we built upon it and we built upon it and we built upon it. And we can automate a whole lot of things that way. And we can create, we have 3D printing. 3D printing actually allows, human beings don't even need to make the machines anymore. We, we can 3D print machines that can make other 3D printed machines. So machines can make themselves now. You really don't need humans in the process of, of production at all, except for designing what you want, you can you can stylize it the way you want, and then you can click this this people live this way already. That's right. People live this way already. This is not even a future scenario that we're trying to hope for. People live this way already, but they have the money to do it because we're still in a money system. So if you want that power, if you want that access, leave this money system. Because when, when we're talking about I want power, I'm sorry, okay. When we want power and, and we want control, those are terms of the capitalist. Those are, so we're still operating under their terms. Leave their terms. Leave their terms. Right. Waste them on their own right. retire. You in the back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, no, I just wanted to add an element. I'm not choosing sides here in this discussion. I, I think it's very interesting what you're, you're posing and trying to get people to kind of move out of the market economy and in, in, uh, that they've lived in grown up in capitalist time. But I just want to correct a point in a way about Marx's analysis, which is that the MCM, M doesn't just stand for money. M stands for who own ownership, <laughs> who own, who has the money and therefore the power to to use it and to connect to buy means of production and hire labor and and engage in a process that's exploitative. So what 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 Marx was doing in the three volumes of Capital, this is just in you know volume one, which is very eluc elucidating, is what he was trying to do is uncover how the capitalist system worked, but both on many levels, but one of them was also how does it reproduce the class, the classes in the manner in which they, how does it reproduce the system in the very act of production? And part of reproducing that system is reproducing the class relationships because you end up getting MCM and those who get M prime are obviously those who can then engage in the process again. And he spends then volumes talking about how this, how this works. So I think what I think what I guess my my take on the zeitgeist is that the, the next place to wrestle with in in the analysis and to move toward is in terms of moving toward the goal you want is to wrestle with the question of power. The resources that we have today are we are engaging in resources for they are owned they are controlled the Amazon right. you know the air the water That's there is a group of people that own them around the globe, and they're not going to give up on them. Yeah. It's still so a political have, problem. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, so we have to wrestle with the question of the existing power and how do we battle with that. So, I mean, it's important to have a vision, a really, vision to go to it. There's a really fascinating book that came out recently called uh, Zero Marginal Cost Society. It was written by a really awesome author named Jeremy Rifkin. I don't know if many of you have heard of it. And he talked about um, he talked about one of the one of the major one of the major reasons why um, why this the society that we talk about is a bit more uh, practical to discuss and bit at this time period is is because of the accelerating decreasing cost of goods and services around the world. One of the things that um, Jerry Rifkin says in this book that's really fascinating is that this is happening as a result of capitalism. Um, capitalism is eating itself up, and it's making it possible for everyone to have access to everything on the, on the planet. Um, I think that's really going to be the trend. He argues that this is something that's going to happen in by, by mid-century. He says by mid-century, we're going to see almost a side-by-side a, a, a -side economy, an economy that one works on for the capitalist as a capitalist society, but another one in which all goods are just ex freely accessible. And that's happening uh, in the digital medium right now. So there's an entire economy that's 
goods and services that move around inside of the digital uh, inside of, on the digital on the digital platform, but they don't have any costs associated with them. Access to films, access to uh, like the clubs. Exactly, they collect the commons in that sense, and 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 yeah, we're creating different um, relationships on um, and ways to monetize those. But just outside, but it can't be done inside of that particular commons. That's also transforming into an internet of things, where things themselves are actually moving into that same um, paradigm, where things become cheap, or things and then accelerate towards zero in terms of the actual cost. There's another book called uh, Free by Chris Anderson, where he talks about this. He has a little bit of a discussion about whether or not it can result in the utopian type of society that we discuss, and he actually he actually talks about it very uh, very much at length in the book. But um, he at least. Red, uh, recognizes that there is a bunch of stuff that's on the horizon or currently here that is accessible and uh, accessible for free. And that points to the to the how. Uh, I think and I think Vance might point to this as well. That uh, excuse me, John uh, will point to this as well. Uh, that uh, that <laughs> that the transit like whatever we posit and this and this is also in that plan on the plan whatever we posit as the way the way that we want to see the world i think like i have friends i have friends who were um, black panthers in the 70s who were doing like awesome work and they thought that in 10 years that you know whatever the panthers mission was the five point plan they thought that that was going to be in existence in 20 years they, they had no question they were like of course this is the, we got this planned out this is going to happen so it's very and, the technocrats, 30, in the 1920s, it's 100 years ago, and we still don't see what they were talking about. And you have Marx in 1860, this like almost 200 years since he, since he wrote, and we're still not seeing the fruition of, you know, of the plans that, in which he wanted to see. So it's like, so it's, it's obvious that plans aren't going to happen, but we can look at trajectories. And the trajectory is that machine automation tech, and technological unemployment are happening. Those are, are real trends that are happening. But they're also re, are relating. They're also democratizing their benefits. They're also making it possible for people who are in the lowest parts of the world who don't have you know access to all types of things. But you know they have access to a cell phone. They have access to being able to you know get to the market, sell goods through the through the online uh, avenues that they have. So it's just talking about it's basically in that sense. It's just the trend. You look at the trend and you see those. Let's stand his hand up for a while. So, I mean, being a guy that's kind of followed up on this movement for a little bit of time, something that I've kind of wondered for a while, and I haven't really had you, heard you guys articulate it yet, um, what, if anything, is, is being planned right now to go ahead and put this into action? Um, you know, as the phrase goes, the proof is in the pudding. You know, when are we getting to, to cooking time, so to speak, and what, what's going to be involved with that? Also, too, for Harry, you mentioned a lot open source software, and I was wondering if you were conflating that with free libre open source software that isn't owned by a corporation, um, isn't subjected to legal licensing and owned. Um, Most people do. When, yeah. they think, when, they, when we think about, it is a problem, at Richard Stallman um, and many other people in the free software movement, they really want you they really wanted to make you very clear of the distinction between free software and open source. Open source is owned by corporations and they offer that license to you to be able to move some things around. But if you make a mistake on the license, you can be charged, you can be sued using uh, open source technology. But then there's free software, which is completely accessible. You have access to that technology, you're able to move around the licenses. And I thank you for very much for that. Yeah, no problem. And then well, as far I, as the, uh, free, the free, software, free software access, but um, it's still, it's, um, it works in an open source, open source capacity. Okay, and then as far as like actually moving into it. So then you have people like, you have some like individuals who have been like on the, on the process of trying to see like how to push a transition. So for me, um, I've been at the United Nations um, um, at the, uh, in the Division of Sustainable Development trying to push different, find little, whatever I can do, having conversations with, you know, very high level UN officials on, on that level. I've been to the Council of Foreign Relations, had conversations with that at the CFR. But at this point, you know, I'm just the guy, you know, I'm just a normal guy who's living his everyday life trying to push some things happening. So I think like the official posture of people who identify themselves as members of the Zeitgeist movement is that we're in an awareness phase and just trying to get people aware of. But it is a really difficult thing to get people to recognize that you do live in a, uh, an environment where you have enough. You know, like everything around us gives us the um, gives us the impression that we do live in a true, you know, uh, relationship of scarcity, in which that's the, how we have to relate to one another, one another 
under that condition. But it, when you look at just the actual trends, you, know, you just look at the, what is actually physically around you. You know, you don't have to be theoretical about this. I mean, and we, for a long time, we had to. Be. We don't have to be theoretical about this. This we do live in a world where we're not living in a partial abundance, at least in the first world. We can make that. We can ex expand that. We can expand that. Uh, it's not that. It's, it's not like automation is you know restricted for North America. It's that we can make sure that automation technology is around. But we also have to make sure that we're not hurting people in the process of automating things. And that's really, I guess, another sense of where the Zeitgeist is coming from, is that all of the value of what automation has has been primarily used to hurt people. So people aren't able to take the benefits of not having to work. You know, work has been conflated with occupation, occupying, that's all we do, are occupying our time in, under our work relationships. What we should be trying to do is figure out how to automate labor and, like, like this, as Harry said earlier, free people to be able to do the things that they're interested in. But it's just not, and that's really where the focus of the movement is. So it's making people aware of that. Because a lot of people they don't know what automation is. They don't really know what the singularity is. They don't know, like all of these different buzzwords that are in the communities of you know, people who know what this stuff is about. And we have other people who are trying to make well, let me just, I, I just want to say that, that really um, reaching people through conversation is, is very valuable and that, that was the purpose of today's panel uh, and, our, and how we're having our discussion and that was the, that's the purpose of the whole conference, right? So um, hopefully um, you can, uh, and, you know, if you, all of us can go out and, and talk about these things and push the ideas that are being presented here. So, what are we doing to make this happen? What are you doing to make this happen? Exactly. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. That's our time. We're going to stay here, but I think we have to leave the room. There's going to be other panels coming up after. So, thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'll be here. Yeah.